Uh, okay, uh, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for joining our webinar today. Uh, in this call, we're going to be talking about some features uh, that we're planning to release soon for multi-tenant support, specifically for MSPs. Uh, looks like we're approaching about 75 or so people on the call. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, so my name is Justin. I'm the founder and CEO here at Patch My PC. Uh, David, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. My name is David James. I'm the uh the Vice President of Engineering here at Patch My PC. I was at uh, Microsoft running the Config Man and parts of Intune, uh, Microsoft Endpoint Manager engineering team for a while, uh, but now I'm here, happy to be here. Yeah. And, right, Cody? Uh, I'm Cody Mathis. I'm a software engineer here at Patch My PC. Cool, so I think to get started, we'll have uh, DJM go ahead and give a little background of kind of where we're at today and what we're planning. Sure. So. What we're going to show today is um, the start of some investments we're making around multi-tenancy. Um, you know, we first started working on this. Multi-tenancy as a feature can be used for lots of different scenarios. Sometimes for, you know, MSPs or, or managed service providers or cloud service providers to manage multiple tenants. Uh, sometimes for a, a single customer that wants to manage multiple installations, whether it's a lab install and a production install, or maybe they just have in config man world multiple hierarchies and they want to manage them in bulk. So while we over time will build more functionality related to multi tenancy, the one we're talking about today is really focused on kind of the cloud service provider space or the managed service provider space that lets uh, those customers manage multiple customers from one installation. Um, there's in, in addition to the technology you're going to see today, there's also some licensing um, optimizations and, and improvements to make that easier. You know, we have some experience over the last uh, couple of years working with MSPs and, and we've made some big investments to make their uh, ability to every month kind of dynamically uh, charge uh, for their customers easier and less manual and that's built into this multi-density uh, but like i said this is the first step uh, we'll have more uh coming and we'll have time for questions uh after the demo uh but yeah i guess that's what i have to say justin go ahead cool. yeah awesome yeah so uh what we're going to do to start is kind of dig into the technical pieces how the tooling works how it connects to multiple tenants uh, we do have quite a few engineers on the chat that can answer questions. And then if we have time, we'll also allow the, the raise hand feature once we're done with the demo uh, for people to potentially come off unmute uh, if we have time for that as well. But questions in the chat throughout the demo, we'll be able to take those with other people. Um, so Cody, do you want to kind of take over? And Yeah, for sure. Uh, actually kind of a fun bit. I saw someone mention education. Thanks you. So that's another interesting perspective, right? Uh, we mentioned multi-tenancy and managing multiple environments. I know um, school districts do things differently as well. So that's a good point. Uh, but uh, going off of a little bit of an assumption, I think a lot of the people on this call have likely used Patch My PC to some extent. Uh, you know, if not, we're always happy to, to answer questions and, and do something that's more like, hey, here's everything about Patch My PC. But we're going to start on, hey, you've probably used it before. I don't really think we're going to touch on the client side of things because at the end of the day, your clients are going to get updates in apps and, and that's a separate flow. That doesn't necessarily a multi-tenant thing. That's all the same. From the multi-tenancy perspective, what I've got pulled up here is two separate instances of the publisher. As we've had discussions in the past, what we've recommended, uh, while this was getting worked on is, hey, if you've got to manage multiple tenants, run multiple instances of the publisher. So here's a scenario such as that. I've got two instances of the publisher. They've got separate configs. They're talking to different tenants. Uh, the place we have it at now, uh, I have one tenant configured here with a drop down of tenants. And I actually have you know the, the original configuration, same tool, this one just has one tenant configured. So what you would be able to do now is say, go out to your separate managed instances, have your configuration here. I've got just a couple of apps selected. I think Notepad++ and, you know, uh, actually that might be the only app here. And then I've got some updates selected as well. Uh, just some super basic configs, couple of that configuration settings. You know, I have my desired setup, maybe, you know, you want to do some retention, you want to copy assignments, uh, nothing crazy. And then within here, I would come in to my existing settings. 
I want to export, right? I already have this exported, but you could come in, grab your settings, and then move over to our multi-tenancy configuration. Uh, at this time, what I have is I have three XML files. I've got one of them that I'm already using, and then I have two of them that are exports from other environments, right? And I have Intune pulled up for all three of these tenants right here in these three separate profiles of Chrome. They're all empty right now. I haven't published anything. So there we go. And what I want to do is import my XML files. I'm just going to select all three. And these are exports from Patch My PC. I'm going to grab them all and open. We're going to see two out of three have been imported. Some configs may need to be updated. And we'll have a KB article that goes in details what those might be. But additionally, if we pull up the log file, uh, we can see that these two specifically were imported based on the XML files. Uh, and then if there are components that are referenced, we're going to log those out as something you might want to take note of. So specifically here, we see that the Google Chrome application had a post install script here that got referenced. You're going to want to make sure that that's accessible from this server. So if you have multiple instances, you might be pulling in pre and post scripts. You might be pulling in code signing scripts. You might be pulling in um, you know, any additional content like that. We're just going to log it out so that you're aware of the content that you might need to migrate uh, as well from those multiple instances if they weren't centralized. So now you'll just get them everything moved over. And then at that point, uh, I now have three tenants here instead of just one. And I can look, for example, on the second tenant. Um, secrets are encrypted per server, so you're going to have to update your secrets, right? Uh, if I've got multiple instances, I'm going to come through here. Uh, in my case, I have all this info stored off. I'll go ahead and just validate that I did that correctly. Uh, you know, this is a super quick way to just say, hey, my Azure app registration is properly configured. Go ahead and save that out. I'll go over to my last one as well. Do the exact same thing. You can rename these. So by default, it is just, you know, coming in here. We're just snagging, uh, you know, the friendly name. So of the tenant, but you can rename these whatever you want. You might want to check that third app registration code. It looked like the passcode was pretty, pretty short. Maybe it was the demo name that was still on the clipboard from the previous. Probably. Thank you. Right there is the correct one, 2000. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Good call. Uh, but you can name these whatever you want. So maybe you actually want to name them after the customer that there are, or the school district, or whatever it might be, just to make things a little bit manageable there. So I've got all three tenants in here now. Each of them has an independent config. Uh, so this one has, for example, Igor, which is going to be 7-zip as apps, and then it has Notepad++. Maybe it has its own set of right-click options. Uh, I can navigate over to another one and see, for example, this one had Google when I imported it. It's got that script that we saw referenced in the log file. So maybe you need to validate access to this and, and just double check that, make sure it can get to the content, move it if you need to, update your references. Uh, you know, you have separate set of updates maybe configured that those might have some existing assignments that were pulled in from that other tenant. So just moving between the two. Uh, and then at that point, the sync can really be kicked off. I have all three tenants configured. I have uh, my secrets are good and tested. I should have access to those resources uh, at that point. We've got alerts are still going to be right now. You're going to have one endpoint, one set of endpoints for your alerts, right? So I have multiple tenants configured. I'm going to get an email report. We should be able to see what that looks like. We're still going to get Teams notifications at this webhook right now. So I'll go ahead and kick off a sync. We do have a couple of tools within the UI that, that talk to Intune using that Azure app registration, and those are still going to be uh, per tenant, right? So if you're in here and you have your tenant selected, you can do the scan. It's going to talk to that app registration. You can query your existing apps in Intune. They're all it's empty right now. You're going to be talking to that tenant. So the header is just going to represent what you're connecting to. And we should see here that we have started processing this specific app ID. So 
Uh, C965. Let's see, that would, I think, be this one. Yeah, awesome. So if I actually go up here, we should see that we're starting to package up 7-zip, for example. And I want to say that is this tenant. Yeah, so similar to experience to what we already have. Uh, we're publishing apps into Intune tenants via Azure app registrations. You're now able to implement multiple Azure app registrations to talk to different tenants and do the configurations that you want. And then during a sync, it's going to respect all of your settings and update them and check for changes and all of that. But you're able to manage everything from one, one instance of the publisher. Um, and then once this finishes, and it'll take a little bit here, we will see uh, the email report as well. Um, now, I know there was a little bit of discussion on licensing. Uh, Justin may be able to speak a little bit to that. I know there's some changes. Yeah, uh, I know, Chelsea, would you want to maybe cover some of the changes there? Yeah, definitely. Um, so as far as our licensing for MSPs for this uh, particular feature, we are going to be removing our previous NDA barrier um, and our licensing for this will be billed monthly at 50 cents per device per month. Um, and then it will be a 500 device minimum, monthly minimum, uh, but you'll have a year to get to that point as well. I did see a question uh, from somebody. So making changes to the new configs, do they reflect in the original instance? So uh, the idea here is you would be decommissioning your, if you were managing multiple tenants and you had multiple instances of Patch My PC, you'd really be exporting your settings, inputting them into the new Patch My PC instance, and then you would turn off the service, at least to start, right? Uh, or turn off syncing, and you would stop using the old instance. You'd be migrating and managing multiple tenants under one instance. You no longer need to log into multiple VMs and make configs across multiple VMs. You'd be able to do this all from one instance of the publisher. So you would realistically be uh, turning down VMs in the end if that's how you're doing it, common to multiple tenants. So Eric Goodman has a really good question. Uh, can you configure apps, updates, and configs that are common to multiple tenants? Uh, at this exact time, no, but we totally intend to do that. So we're starting to have some discussions with some MSPs on you know, some of the really just quick value add features. Um, can we configure, I wanna configure Google Chrome with these settings across all of the tenants, right? Or I wanna have a template tenant, something like that. Uh, definitely that's something we will be implementing. Uh, we're just trying to at least get the immediate ask of multi-tenant management, and then we want to identify what are the really big value adds going forward. Hey, thanks, Cody. Also, a couple uh, licensing questions. Hey, I see Ronnie, you have a question. Hey, Ronnie, long time no see. Um, the monthly billing, the way it's worked in the past is MSPs had to update it, but we are going to automatically adjust it monthly and send the MSPs mail based on their device usage saying this is what your monthly usage was. Um, and it will automatically adjust to this for this month's billing and push here to update it or correct it or override it. So we, we this is one of the improvements that we're doing is uh, removing some of that overhead for MSPs. And then the 500 devices limit, as Chelsea answered in chat, is total, not per tenant. So if you're an MSP, uh, 500 devices uh, across all your tenants, that's the minimum price. Uh, I know there's been, a, it's come up a couple times uh, in terms of a tenant limit. Uh, there is not a, a hard tenant limit. We, we have kind of a soft discussion around tenant limit right now where we're, we're we're looking at 10 but that's more so because initially we're looking to understand scalability um in the end no there will there will not be a limit right we don't we don't want to have a cap on the number of tenants you can manage uh but we just want to make sure we approach that correctly right so if you've got 50 tenants 100 whatever it might be the end goal is to not have a limit there at all um yeah so it's, that's that's where we're headed 
where we are right now is let's have a subset of tenants and, and, and see the pain points that we may or may not have and go from there. Um, and I do see, so can I get the same set of apps for all tenants in one shot? I think that revisits the, you know, the concept of can I have like a template or I can I configure all tenants at once? Uh, that's one of the enhancements we want to try to handle and, and do a, a good job of that. So that's definitely something we're going to investigate. Yeah. Hey, Cody. Like just yeah. Oh, go ahead. Do you want Do you want to talk about some of the other uh, improvements on our list that we haven't got to yet that we're considering? Yeah, actually, give me just a moment. <laughs> he's gonna go find them. Yeah, let me find the list real quick. Yeah, and one thing while he's pulling that up, uh, it looks like we just looped through those three tenants, published the app. So one additional thing we can look at as well is some of the changes to the email reports and the team's notifications. I think we had that configured in the, uh, the me tenant right. as well, Cody. We do. So right here, uh, let's make it, oh, this didn't make it much bigger. Um, view, open. So if you've received the email reports in the past, uh, the structure is generally similar here but we have it per tenant. So it's a little bit new. You know, we've got a new logo and all that stuff. We link off to some KB articles. Um, and the really core difference also is now when it's done, you're going to get that header that says, hey, this Intune tenant that you specified the friendly name of had these applications and updates created or updated. So we can see here we had the three different tenants, and this was the information across those three, whether they created apps or updates. You've got all your CVE data. Um, you know, you can link off to to the release notes. Uh, you had dark, and it's dark themed. Yeah, you have, Jake really pushed us on that one. He provided us something to work with, and we kind of went from there. So uh, hopefully, this is a little bit of a better format for the email. Uh, in terms of where we want to head, there's a few different components that during we've had some discussions with customers and then something that uh, what we want to do as well as we've worked to develop this uh, notifications is something I think we're really keen on feedback for because we don't want information overload. We want to provide customers useful reports with regards to what the publisher did because the way somebody managing multiple tenants or multiple customers in an MSP type scenario or multiple school districts, whatever it might be, the type of data they care about might be different, how they want to get the data might be different, because this very quickly is going to become uh, a document that you end up receiving nearly, right? This was three tenants with a few apps and updates, but if you have 50 tenants or 100 tenants, we're interested in how you would want to get that data in a useful way. So that would always be, you know, greatly appreciated feedback. And that's one of the things we want to be aware of. Um, on top of that, as it stands, right, there are some configurations that are going to be per tenant, and there are some configurations that are going to be global. Uh, getting a handle on which one of those makes sense and where to put focus is also going to be valuable for us. As it stands, your Intune options page, this is, right here, your per tenant settings, right? These settings apply per tenant. You can configure them and change them and, you know, as it is. Um, what we're looking to do is definitely address the scalability. That's one of the primary components because we know that we don't want to have a limit of 10 or any soft number at all. Uh, and then we want to address notifications. We want to address from a reporting perspective, how can we aggregate the data that you're getting back here from your multiple tenants? And then from there as well, I think we want to know what can we do? What's What should be the primary focus from the multi-tenant perspective that we're not addressing? Because a lot of the feature development that we have is specific to one tenant. So does scoping matter more or less, like RBAC scoping? Uh, do you want to be able to get data from the clients? Uh, we're looking for more feedback, really. Let's see if I can find an email from Cody. <laughs> yeah, so we did have a question around Power BI or Defender. Um, so what we have today with Power BI would be the same Intune Power BI reports that are available 
or download from the website if somebody could could link those for what we have today but that's also an area that we're we're constantly thinking about it is what reporting can we do with Intune uh, with some of the limitations there and how we can improve that but we do have some power bi reports available today yeah for sure and and that's going to be uh, an interesting topic to expand on because we have we have to work within some of the constraints of of Intune and Azure and we'd have to try to find a friendly way to aggregate data uh, you know across your multiple tenants and, and what's the the worker process that does that so definitely want to have a keen handle on what would be useful data there yeah let me let me pause and and go kind of bigger picture for a minute and then then we can come back into some more questions um you know some of you that are out there that that run these kind of businesses uh providing uh, support and technology for mobile other customers. What, you know, what we built here actually helps you do what our core business is, which is administer uh, patching updates and applications across mobile customers kind of in bulk. Now we could do better. You know, Bruce had a good suggestion about how we could use templates and overrides. And we've been thinking about getting that right in the UI experience. But let me ask a different question. You know, what are some features or um, value that we could add for MSPs that is really unique to the MSP scenario. So, for example, I was thinking, is there special reports uh, that we could build? For example, maybe you want us to generate a report for each of your tenants that you can forward on to your tenants that give them information. So, I just wanted to take a, a few minutes and, and brainstorm either with people on the chat or or if you want to even uh, talk about it verbally, we can you can come off mute and we can talk about. It. But I'm looking for beyond what you've just seen here, what's more value that we can add that would make your business easier? Yeah, that's a good comment on the proactive remediations. Um, that's something that's similar to what we thought about, but I think, yeah, I think your suggestion is really interesting. Scott, thanks, Scott. question all right so our back question. support oh go ahead yeah i saw there's a question on our back and let me let me come back to that a little bit after some of these uh flow so being tied to endpoint defender for endpoint yeah i think we need to come back uh cody and think more about the defender for endpoint integration i know we yeah. have some challenges there because we get a lot of false detections yeah, we we have we have discussed. So we have the scan tool that scans in tune, but that's based on the graph data for device inventory, which is it is what it is. Um, but we we have mocked up integration to endpoint uh, defender for endpoint. They present the data in a funny way, but we've definitely looked at it. Um, we might be able to provide similar tooling, right? Where we can suggest software that might be good to patch based on endpoint. Yeah, and the MDE API sucks. Um, that's, yeah, I'm skirting around saying it, but there it is. Um, yeah, it's not unworkable, but it's interesting. Yeah, and, and then Gary, the custom uh, applications is something that is actually high on our list now. And we are looking to build that feature, not just for MSPs, although, Building for MSPs is an interesting twist. Okay, yeah, that, well, I'm gonna put that on our list to, to think about. Ronnie, I saw your comment on um, changing our licensing from device to user, and I think I understand the implication, but Ronnie, maybe uh, Justin and I will reach out and, and talk to you on that and make sure that we understand. I'm, I'm assuming that's more M365, kind of E3 and E5. You're not looking for M365B. Uh, James, it looks like you have your hand up. Do you want to come off on mute for a question? Yeah, it's more of a sort of observation around sort of reporting and thinking as this sort of scales out um, mm -hmm. where you've got sort of a lot of customers with a lot of um, a, lo a lot of a lot of customers very security focused, uh, reporting about when a critical vulnerability is released, where they sit, and being able to report, you know, on 
where that where that release is in their environment so you know is it published their environment yet you know are they subscribed to it and having sort of dashboard reports that you can easily make available to customers because we often see that come through as like new critical vulnerabilities out there that we're asked what's our exposure to this now i appreciate you've only got limit you can only if you're publishing that out you should know where that is in the in the process you know is it with a test group is it like published to all, de- all devices what's the uptake like and the ability to quickly pull that together for multiple customers and like, even better would be to be able to publish that out via power bi to those customers directly so they can go and self-serve them would be hugely valuable um because it when whenever you see a critical vulnerability come out and you've got 100 customers asking the same question it's really hard to mobilize quickly to answer that question 100 times over we we have some components being worked on that will hopefully well not hopefully that will improve in the end uh the conversation around vulnerabilities and 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 our product right so we know that one of the values of patching is you're patching vulnerabilities. The way I always frame it is I don't really care if you're running the latest version of Adobe. I care if you've patched all the vulnerabilities with relation to Adobe, right? Um, you know, whether or not you've got the latest features isn't necessarily why I'm installing these new updates. It's to remediate vulnerabilities. So we want to improve that, right? We want to show the vulnerabilities that are remediatable and expand that into you know, what should be remediated in your environment, what has been found, and how can you ensure that it has been remediated, right? Because uh, CVEs span multiple apps. Uh, you know, the same CVE can apply to anything that uses Chromium. That same CVE for Oracle might be in Adopt Open JDK. It might be in the micro, you know, it might be in multiple apps. So we want to try to make that picture clearer. Uh, and I think as part of that, it would it would span the multiple tenants scenario. Uh, so that's definitely something we're cognizant of. Thank you. Licensing questions, that's outside my territory. I just make sure it works. Yeah, so uh, I think reporting is an interesting discussion uh, because, you know, there there's a uh, there's other reporting alternatives, but Power BI is kind of the reigning king here uh, because you're in Azure. Um, but I do think it's an interesting discussion to have. I know some people use Tableau, some people use Power BI, some people use alternatives. Um, and and having something and there's always going to be a cost associated with it, and that's that's a fun conversation to have because there's definitely going to start to be. Um, integrations and features that will have ancillary costs, right? Right now, we publish apps into Intune and, and we we fire off data to you via maybe Teams notifications uh, with webhooks or via emails. Um, we're going to end up with features that are behind additional license costs from a uh, Microsoft side, behind spinning up workspaces and and maybe it's workbooks or resource groups so i think that's something that we'll be keen to to learn a bit more about and like how palatable is that right what does it look like when you're not just paying for patch my pc but you're looking to pay for uh, additional resource costs we want to definitely understand what that looks like from from our customers perspective uh, you know we don't want to have a it, a large amount of unknown costs or completely untethered costs. And uh, you should be able to also come off on mute now uh, without requiring like a raised hand. So if anyone does have questions, we you can unmute if you prefer to do over voice as well. Yeah, so I do see the question I, come up again. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, this is Scott. I was um, chatting a little bit ago about the Defender for Endpoint um, integration in there. Um, one of the things that I've found has been interesting as some of our customers have moved into Defender for Endpoint Plan 2 is the number of ancient software applications that they have installed on one or two computers and they don't realize. So that ability to proactively scan you know, with Defender for Endpoint already doing that for you. Um, 
and then add the apps that are in your software catalog from Defender to Endpoint into Patch My PC would be phenomenal. Or, or even just an exception report of like, here's an email of you have A, B, and C on and you're missing D. Mm -hmm. So is it is it mostly you want to leverage Defender to know things that Patch My PC isn't patching that it could and should? Correct. Okay, awesome. Yeah, we love this scenario too. Yeah. We we do it a little bit. We do it based on um, config man inventory, but we could do better. Mm -hmm. And integrating with uh, Defender actually would make it powerful. Do you use? Do you know if um, most of the customers, either you or customers you work with, are using Defender E3 or E5? That's one of the challenges we've had. Is some of the capabilities we'd want to build on are limited to E5, um, and we were mm -hmm. not sure if that how much. To just give my knowledge of Microsoft, I know that's not a big coverage yet in customers. So um, personally, we've seen an uptick with it. We work a lot with uh, government um, contractors. And so we see folks buying either the uh, Defender for Endpoint Plan 2 license, which gives you that threat and vulnerability management pack, which is what you need to tie into. Um, because that's got the software catalog. Um, and then we're also seeing a, a significant uptick in um the E5 space and that Microsoft E5. Yeah, this awesome. Thanks, thanks, Scott. That's really good information. So in your mind, uh, if we built something that did what you said, but it was limited to E5, I'd have to go look if Plan 2 has an API. It, it would still be beneficial. Oh, yeah. Oh, hugely. Awesome. And I'll, yeah, I'll give you a perfect example. I came across a, a customer recently that had um, an instance of 7-Zip that was from um, like 2014. Right, it was installed on four of their computers. They didn't even know it was there, um, and we're like, "Oh, that's bad." <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thanks. This, this is, is really the, valuable, uh, Scott. Thanks. Absolutely. That's the dynamic I was kind of talking about, right? Because there's there's a lot of interesting things we can do, um, but we it, we don't want to assume that we have access to all of these features. We've got to find a middle ground, and then you know, uh, assess that. So it's definitely uh, interesting. Uh, I know, uh, David, you might be able to speak to it a little bit. Somebody asked, is there a beta program? Is just, just going to be a yeah. preview? Do you want to address that? Man, I got too many questions coming from too many places. Um, yeah, so beta, I'll probably send out a, a tweet today. Um, we have this working. We have a what we call an, a kind of insider preview program now. So we... For example, we have Intune ADRs for Intune is a, a feature we have in, in private preview, which means customers that are working closely with us can unlock it in their current already deployed build. It's not like beta software they have to deploy. It's already built in. They just have to turn, we have to turn it on for them. We're at that place with the MSP functionality. And so we'll probably take um, some applications for five to 10 customers that want to try it early uh, and give us feedback. It, it, you know, like I said, it's in the built in release build, you just need to switch with it for us to flight it on for you. And that way we can find some of the some of the changes that we still need to improve um, before we release it to everybody. So if you're interested in that kind of program, we'll release a, a tweet out today on how to um, apply and how to get involved. I, Simon, I won't forget the RBAC question. I'll come back to it. Justin, did I cover all the questions? That you called me? I think so. Yeah, I think so. Okay, I, I sorry, think I, got, like a, I got behind between the two chats. I think from like a timeline perspective for like actual release, yeah. I think we're shooting for probably a month or two. Um, or when yeah. this would be kind of publicly available for MSPs. Yeah, if you look, you know, our ADR feature actually is taking a little bit longer, but this is why we've started the, the insider program that we have is so that we can ship to customers and then we find things that um, still need to be fixed. I know Bruce is on the call and he helped us find some good improvements for ADRs for Intune that we needed. So our goal probably, our goal would be if everything went awesome within the next month, but once we start our insider deployment of the MSP functionality, um, then we'll see. We'll see if, if everything's mostly working and we can just tweak it and then ship it, or if we need a couple uh, bigger changes, in which case we're probably two months away. So yeah, that's what I mean, one to two months. Um, so yeah, I think uh, that that goes back to 
us being careful about the the decisions we make and the engineering time we spend. We we have developed the publisher as it stands with you know a primary focus over the past handful of years, and so we don't want to put something out there and a lot of effort into something before even getting it into MSP hands or this type of customer's hands uh, and miss the mark, right? When we could have released something that missing some features, you know, we won't deny that. We know that there's more that it needs to do and can do, um, but we don't want to spend a bunch of engineering time and then give you something and you don't use 600 hours worth of engineering time. Um, So let's give you something, let's get feedback, and then let's put even more time into it. Yeah, so um, Simon, I'm still going to come back to our back. Let me step back a little bit too and talk again about our roadmap. So what what this covers today is a good feature for managing multiple Intune tenants, multi, multi-tenant way. I don't know for, for that. Uh, um, it does not include the, the bulk configuration of multiple config man tenants. Um, now it does, if you are a config, if you are an MSP that manages config man customers as well, we still have some improvements here, specifically around the licensing and, and the reporting, but you would still need a publisher installation for each of those config man tenants. You can use one publisher installation for all of your Intune tenants that you're managing, but config man, the way that the integration works because this installs locally on the on-prem environment and talks to local config man, we're still working through if we, if and how we make the changes for that. We have talked to some customers that, for example, are 50-50, half their tents are Intune, half of them are, are config man. Again, they would run one publisher installation for all their Intune tenants. That would be one license, and then they would have multiple publisher installations for their config man tenants. We still will have a license improvement where that one license key will work for all those, but it will aggregate up in reporting and show the total. So even if you're a config man and an MSP that manages some config man, there's still some improvements here, just not the bulk edit one that we demoed today. Uh, in the future, we will end up with a SaaS only solution that won't require an on-prem install. Um, so that's on that's on our roadmap. And and probably, although we haven't decided, we would also have the ability to bulk edit multiple config man installations as well. Um, so those are some things that are further on our roadmap. Um, I see one hand up there. Uh, Sylvia, you had a question, comment? Uh, yeah, my question is um, is a little bit uh, strange. I mean, uh, if you plan in the future to integrate uh, custom application, for example, you have a, a great uh, repository, but it's not enough. Uh, many applications are missing. Uh, and yeah, you have the uh wish uh, wish list uh, but uh, from my point of view is um, is not a good uh, good idea because the democracy sometimes it doesn't work uh i i want to uh, uh, upload uh, the same custom application and uh, um, share this application to all the tenants that i manage in the future this could be possible uh, you are working on you are thinking about this for example just to give you a name parallels is uh, one of the uh, application that we use to all of our customers is a uh, similar like uh, citrix uh, workspace or uh, vmware or the remote microsoft remote app and uh, the, the the idea is uh, publish this application through patch my pc and deploy to all the tenants yeah, yeah, great, great question. Um, so this is definitely a ask we hear a lot. So I'm, I'm curious, Silvio, like, would this be a scenario where you're talking about kind of custom apps, whether it's internal or not? Would would this be a scenario where you just want the publisher to be able to kind of inject a Intune win file that, that you already created and, and created some logic for and then just have us automatically push it into multiple tenants? Or would it be like a UI where you're expecting kind of where you can put input switches and detection logic and then just say send so you don't have to worry about the app creation tools for Intune. I'm just trying to understand the scenario there. Mm, good question. I mean, uh, uh, 
so could, could be could, could be the uh, the the row setup or could be the the win 32 uh because the, the as you know the msi is much easier to uh for the deployment, because all the syntax uh, is already done. Uh, for the EXE, is much complicated because uh, every application uh, have this different uh, syntax for the silent deployment. Uh, by the way, it could be add your MSI or add your uh, Win package, uh, the, the, the Intune package. So yeah. I think from our side, what we're wondering is um, right now, you know, we we have our catalog and as part of our catalog, uh, you know, what we have done is gone in and packaged these up and tested them and validated the command lines. And then we curate it in that we we have some additional metadata around how to uninstall it, uh, how to generate the detection for it, how to. Uh, and then we have the hash of the file so we know that it's valid. And then when we manage the catalog, when new versions come out, we do the same type of validation and then we update our catalog. So if we were to provide tooling for for custom applications, right, um, we would likely not have a way necessarily to completely automate it. Um, those extra components, the extra metadata would have to to come from you still. The customer would likely still have a lot of legwork, um, right? We would likely be able to add like a friendly way to get things to Intune and maybe kind of some recipes. And we do have some further ambitions that are out related, but a little outside of custom apps. Um, so it's it's a popular user voice item. We do have it here. Uh, I know there's kind of like, yeah, votes. Uh, I think you kind of mentioned, right? Democracy is not necessarily the best option here. Uh, and it's a, it's no, for a, this, it's a yes, for, for the application, it doesn't because, uh, 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 for example, what I'm looking for is uh, the, all the tools to manage the, the, the clients mm -hmm. like uh, HP, the, the support assistant, or the Dell uh, support assistant tool, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like other other uh, application. Uh, these are, uh, no, no, it's mm -hmm. not present. Don't try to. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, by the way, um, the uh, this is the, the command update, but it's different from the support. There's another yeah, another no, kind of. By the way, is this is not the point, but it's just to tell you, if I mm -hmm. find the, the MSI and I want to uh, update this package into patch my PC, just because uh, I'm talking about the MSP version, because obviously if I manage only one product. Uh, is the same to do this uh, from uh, patch my PC or from Intune portal is the same. Mm -hmm. But for the multiple uh, deployment uh, could be much better use one single uh, uh, user interface. Yeah, no, I, I think I understand that scenario uh, and I think that that could be an interesting thing to point where maybe there's like a standard app that whether or not it's us that create it, the ability to kind of import a pre-curated app that, that you've created the Intune metadata for, but then kind of import that and, and sync it to multiple tenants. Sounds like that's the scenario. Uh, what I think we'll probably do in the next month or two is I'll paste like a, a link where we have a similar kind of webinar because we do want to understand, like that's a very popular user voice, understand exactly what the different scenarios are that people are looking for. Um, so I think we'll 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 come back in the next month or two and have like a discussion kind of like this, where we try to get some more import and make sure we fully understand all the scenarios. Because um, I know we do have different scenarios even in the comments of that user voice. Um, so I think that will probably be our next step to understand, you know, is there a way that we can do this without causing a a load for support? Where hey, if you build a custom app, maybe you give us some of the metadata, but you know we'll push that to the tenants, but 
it wouldn't be something that we would support if the applicability or installation commands are wrong. If it's one of those scenarios where you create like a single app that you just want to go into multiple tenants. So I, I think we'll have a discussion around that soon. So just stay uh, stay tuned on the comments of that. If you're subscribed, you should automatically get alerted when we add that comment to register. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So a, a couple things uh, queued up, Simon, I, I owe you a answer on our back. Simon, if you can come off mute, that'd be awesome. If not, that's fine too. Um, the RBAC situation, it's some of the, and for those of you who don't know, RBAC is role-based access control. So this is the ability to control which of your admins have access to which things. Right now inside Patchfind PC, we don't really have RBAC. Um, the scenarios haven't needed it. Going into multi-tenancy, it implies maybe we need it and some of the, some of the questions that we get around it. Right now, if you think about the UI, those of you that use it a lot, you realize Patch my PC, the publisher UI is really about configuring the flow of updates into an Intune or config man tenant or the flow of, of applications and when they update and how often and, and adding them. And so they both, the, but whether you're in the config man side or the Intune side, we're, we're flowing applications updates into the Intune config man tenant, but then there's our back there. Right. So our back integration, you could say it can mean a lot of different things. Do we want our back on the publisher? So multiple users can use parts of it. Right. Or do you want our back on the applications that are put into config man or Intune and they're they're limited to certain security scopes by default? Um, or maybe in the multi tenancy one that's come up is uh, some of the MSPs want to give our back to their customers so that they could come up into the publisher UI and configure their own apps um, without configuring other apps. Because right now, the way it works is the demo that Cody did, that is one security scope. It, it, you can configure all of the managed tenants from one place. We don't have a per managed tenant kind of our back there. And so when people ask about our back, it's unclear to me sometimes which of these three or four scopes they're talking about. Uh, right now, I don't feel strongly we should be adding our back into the publisher um, because I don't think the flows are, are that. But yeah, Simon, if you can come up mute, let's have a, a quick conversation, kind of what you're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. And sorry for the bad audio quality. No, um, I, I, I do fine. think that, yeah. Um, so the first scenario would absolutely be that we might have uh, hundreds of customers at one point. Okay. And, uh, awesome. Not we love that. All, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the upside of being a telco. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I do think that we will have multiple. Uh, we have something that's a personal IT technician. They are managing around 30 customers each, but they are not allowed to manage other customers. So instead of having multiple server instances, uh, it would be great to be able to scope it down so that we could have one server instance uh, and allow multiple people to log on and manage their customers. Uh, could do it with multiple servers, absolutely, but it would just be better in terms of scaling. I do okay. think that there's I, so that's what what is what I was primarily thinking of, and it might also extend to not allowing a certain technician to do whichever setting they like from the publisher. Uh, yeah, but primarily and, and some, separating duties. Let me let me ask to make sure I understand. So maybe these numbers aren't your numbers, but just pretend with me. So maybe you have a hundred tenants, but maybe you have like four uh, people that manage the tenants, and you want to divide those hundred into like twenty five each across those four, and they can only access their twenty five. Is that kind of what you're saying? Yes, exactly that. Okay. And is it more than that, or that's basically it? When they come into the publisher UI, you want them just to see only those and only be able to touch those 25 tenants they have access to. Yeah, that, that would be ideal so that they, it's also a matter of how they find their tenants. So ideally, I would like a single individual to log into a server which may host a thousand tenants uh, and only see the tenants they are responsible for and only be able to uh, take actions on those. Right. Okay. I 
I, I'm glad you shared this scenario. I'm, to be honest, I've never thought about this scenario. I've thought about like those other R back scenarios. Yeah. So thanks for educating me about this. This is good. Yeah. And um, yeah, we, because we, we we are managing a, we are managing eleven thousand customers today. Wow, that's uh, and awesome. We hope, of course, to, and we hope, of course, to to extend this to as many of them as we can, and yeah, therefore we need to be certain that we can do that in a fairly streamlined way. Okay, cool. I, you know, I I'm not going to make uh, any kind of short term commitments on this, but the scenario I understand and I value. Um, it might be it might be that when we do our SaaS UI, that that's a better place that, that kind of allows this kind of um, feature. But I, I just haven't even thought about it, you know, until five minutes ago. So um, I'm going to put it on the list. You feel free to nag me in the future about this feature and I'll, I'll give you updates. Um, but now it makes sense to me. Does it, did we bottom the ocean out in the comments uh, in the chat, uh, Justin and Cody? Is there anything else for Chelsea? Um. You know, just kind of elaborating on RBAC tough type stuff, getting an understanding. Uh, there's some interesting points around, you know, the integration with with TBM or with E5 or Defender for Endpoint, right? Because it's it's shoehorning into, hey, it's a Microsoft solution, and that's I try to discuss that a little bit too. Like reporting, for example, if if it's like, oh, you do it with Power BI, you're pigeonholing yourself. Um, so that's the type of feedback I do think we're interested in is. That's us providing a solution, um, and and that maybe that's not always what we want to do, right? If if we can also understand how can we provide useful data to you so that you can have your solution work as well, I think that's interesting. Um, us providing Power BI reports is great. Us providing a nice way to get you data so that you can report on it how you want as well. You know, there's a different dynamic here when we're working with a single customer or, uh, uh, you know, they they just maybe they just want the report. Uh, when we're working with somebody that is already a high profile user and maybe has a team of people dedicated to doing reporting, they probably don't want our report or they want to do more than what our report provides. Um, so if we can understand those types of needs as well, I think there's a lot of value there. We don't want to pigeonhole you into using our tooling. Uh, in some of these scenarios, we want to also provide you the components so that your tooling can improve as well, right? How can we add value? And sometimes adding value is not us giving you the solution. It's letting you also cater your solution. Yeah, we want all the data. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's, I think, a little bit of where I'm kind of coming from here, right? Um, Maybe we don't necessarily provide you the end goal, but I think that we can also provide you the highway to get there uh, in a good way. <laughs> SQL. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I think most of the questions are mostly answered at this point. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. All right, so I mean, we're just about at time as well, uh, so maybe we could uh, go ahead and wrap up. So um, yeah, I just want to thank everybody that, that was able to make it. We got a ton of great feedback. Um, like David said, he'll be posting something on Twitter where we will uh, be looking for a few uh, kind of insiders to help us with even like a pre-preview. Uh, we're expecting the next month or two that we'll uh, have something released. What we'll do is once we actually go to production, we'll email everybody that was registered for this event just to kind of let you know and uh, take you to a link that kind of explains all the new features and we'll have our, our docs updated by then as well. Um, but outside of that, I think uh, I think we're all good from our side. So just want to thank everybody for joining.